So America Needs Talent was really derived from the couple of decades of experience that I had had uh, working in this space, this intersection of public policy, higher education, and philanthropy. And it was really motivated by this idea that uh, we need to be in a different place, that American prosperity has really been defined by our talent development and deployment. Certainly in the 20th century, we did that through things like uh, having a great K-12 education system, having an elite higher education system that could really uh, produce the leaders and the folks that are actually gonna make a difference in leadership in this country. But what we've learned over the course of the last several decades is that the nature of work has changed and the way in which American prosperity uh, really needs to be developed is quite different. Today, two million jobs are unfilled in the American economy because of a lack of qualified talent. And we know that three-fourths of CEOs of companies say that finding talent is their number one priority, more so than even things like health care or taxes. And we also know that three-quarters of all the jobs, or two-thirds of all the jobs being created today require a college education, and that three-quarters of those jobs are going to uh, require people to have knowledge, skills, and abilities that continues to evolve and grow and, and change over time because of the changing nature of work. And so the book was motivated by this idea that we actually need to have a plan, a plan to uh, develop and deploy the talent that America needs in the 20th century. And that was my motivation for writing the book. You know, I think that uh, one of the uh, issues here in the 20th century for us as a country is that uh, we need to actually see our higher education system in a different way than we did in the past. In the past, it was really designed to develop an elite class of leaders that would uh, make a difference in our economic and social lives. But the reality is that today, because of the changing nature of work in a, in a knowledge economy, it's not just that some jobs require higher education, it's that all jobs require more and better post-secondary learning. In higher education, colleges and universities, community colleges, four-year institutions, and all types of, of post-secondary learning uh, enterprises need to be engaged in this talent development and deployment process for our country. And I think that uh, higher education has to, be, has to see itself as driving the change that will increase American prosperity in our country. Now, Lumina Foundation has been focused on this work since 2008, trying to uh, be a catalyst for the country to help produce the talent that we need to make us prosperous in, 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 in our economic work, prosperous in our, in our social efforts, prosperous in our cultural well-being. And our work has really been uh, focused on this idea that 60% of Americans should have a high quality post-secondary degree certificate or, or other high quality credential. And that goal, which is a goal for the country, which we see ourselves as a, as a catalyzing organization for, is uh, derived from this fact that the nature of work has changed, that prosperity will be defined by our talent. And higher education has to see itself as an engine of that prosperity, as an entity that can actually help produce the talent and deploy it in American society through all of the different ways in which our students who become graduates uh, actually can apply themselves in their communities, in their workplaces, in their families, and, and ultimately in our collective well-being. Part of the challenge that I think we face as a country is that many people understand that we need a higher level of talent, but I think what's challenging to all of us is this real sense of urgency, this idea that doing a little better isn't good enough. Today, roughly 45% of Americans have a certificate or a degree. Uh, we need at least 60% of Americans to have high quality degrees, certificates, and other post-secondary credentials. So we have this gap, this difference in terms of what society's needs are and what we're producing in our colleges and universities today. And so, you know, I think our fate is really going to be determined by our ability to collectively come together to understand that this is an urgent task and actually find the opportunities to uh, produce and deploy the talent that's needed. Now, I think that uh, 
trustees and, and CEOs of colleges and universities have a particularly important task here because together they've actually got to reinvent, redesign the learning process so that the students, the learners at those institutions actually have the knowledge, the skills, the ability, the talent that they need to be successful in work and in life. And uh, that's going to require college and university trustees and CEOs to be less focused on the competitive environment in which they, they live, less focused on the day-to-day -day elements of, of what they might deal with, and more on what their role is in producing this talent more broadly. So for example, uh, I think each college and university in this country should set its own goals for how it can actually produce more and better talent for America. Every institution has a mission, every institution has goals. I certainly don't think that institutions should dramatically change their goals, but how they produce that talent, how they deliver it, is going to be increasingly important. And for some institutions, they've got capacity to serve more students. In some institutions, they've got capacity to create higher levels of, of quality. That should really be the focus of what the, the trustees and CEOs do. For a long time, I think we've seen the workforce needs of the country as primarily being about content. In other words, we needed people who understood specific things. We need more engineers. We need more people who are teachers. We need more people who can apply themselves in specific contexts. But what we've come to recognize is that we need a combination of things from our colleges and universities because what our workforce needs is both people who can apply themselves to the content knowledge that they get from their learning, but also have generalizable skills, things like critical thinking and problem solving and communicating, things that will actually help them be adaptable in the workplace and help them um, meet the needs of, of a changing economy and advance themselves as individual workers in that economy by having that adaptability, by having that focus on uh, being able to work in teams and, and, and uh, communicate and work in other, uh, in other ways that actually apply themselves in this constantly changing context. So you know, I think it's important for the trustees of colleges and universities and for the, the leaders of those institutions to understand that their task is to produce people who have credentials degrees, certificates, and, and other types of credentials that will actually allow people to apply themselves, give them the proficiency that they need in those generalizable contexts as well as in content-specific areas. And what that's going to mean is that we're going to have to have a conversation as a country about how we actually produce that talent through our colleges and universities and through other post-secondary learning contexts and whose job it is to produce uh, that higher level of, of talent depending on the talent needs that we have. All certificates, all degrees, all credentials should have both content knowledge and generalizable skill as a key element of what they have because talent really is knowledge, skills, and abilities. And if you bring all of those things together, it's going to require all types of credentials that are being produced to actually represent that combined effort uh, that combined focus that is talent, that is those knowledge, skills, and abilities. Well, you know, I think one of the th issues that we have to confront is that higher education has been an engine of social and economic progress for our country for decades, but that that role has to change. It has to change because of our changing workforce needs. It has to change because of the changing ways in which society requires us to be more effective participants in our democracy, to be, to be uh, uh, more co focused on our uh, cultural and social well-being. And so, you know, I think that uh, the colleges and universities need to understand that their role in this process, uh, the, the ways in which we actually need to redesign higher education, has to be focused on producing talent. In other words, that uh, a key element of their work is to rethink how they do that in order to be able to uh, produce the talent that America needs. One of the challenges I think we have in American higher education is that we haven't come to grips with uh, the major issues that uh, confront our learners today. For too many students, our system is unaffordable. Uh, we recognize that the rising price of college, both tuition price and living costs, have exceeded ability to pay, have exceeded general economic conditions, and that's a problem. 
we recognize that uh, not enough Americans actually have high quality post-secondary uh, degrees, certificates, and other credentials, and that's got to change. We have a shortage, a deficit of talent. And we also have to come to grips with the fact that for too many of our learners, they don't always have the talent, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they need to be successful in work and in life. We know from public opinion surveys, from academic studies, that in fact uh, the uh, ways in which uh, students are, are learning are changing and that what students know and are able to do has to continue to evolve to reflect that. In other words, the quality of the learning that's inherent in the enterprise is going to need to continue to advance, that our, our degrees and certificates and other credentials are going to have to re represent proficiencies, real and relevant learning that matters in work and in life. And so I think the process of system redesign is underway, that we are recognizing that we do need a more affordable system, that we do uh, need to have more uh, people with high quality credentials, and that we do need to focus on the fact that uh, the quality of those credentials ultimately comes down to the proficiencies, the competencies that people have. So this is our, our task in higher education. It's to redesign the system, to rethink the model so that it literally serves more students better. So, you know, we have lots of ideas that have been floated in public policy over the course of many decades uh, in order to help improve the quality of life for Americans. So we've long had a social security trust that takes care of our fellow citizens later in life when they're past their, their um, useful uh, working lives in order to make sure that um, our elderly population, our, our, our older population, doesn't suffer a significant financial uh, calamity, a significant financial loss as they get older. Well, similarly, I think we need to think about things like talent in terms of this trust perspective. In other words, that we need to actually think about the development and deployment of talent as a talent trust, something that at the federal level we could actually get contributors, not just the federal government, but also employers and individuals to contribute to this talent trust so that uh, you as an individual can actually qualify for a certain amount of resources to help you develop your knowledge, skills, and abilities, your talent, over the course of your lifetime. In the modern economy, and in, in modern society, it's not likely that you will be able to be successful simply by going, getting a degree or other credential, and then living a work life after that. The traditional learning model simply doesn't work. We need a lifelong learning approach, and we need a mechanism for funding that lifelong learning approach that will meet the needs of the students. And this idea of a talent trust is a way of creating a trust account for all individuals so that they would be able to actually access resources over an extended period of time to get trained in an area, to, de to get a degree or, or other credential, but then to go back and uh, reskill themselves, gain new knowledge and abilities as the nature of work and as the, as the conditions of their lives change. So that's really the idea behind this talent trust. It's this idea of creating a much bigger societal expectation for uh, what, we, what we can do with our talent and how we can actually get the resources to apply that talent in work and in life. You know, it's interesting. I think that for a long time we've believed that the way people learn is primarily or maybe even exclusively in traditional learning contexts. In the case of higher or post-secondary education, that would be in colleges and universities. But I think what we've come to recognize is that people have opportunities for high quality learning in many different contexts. That colleges and universities are still a primary engine of talent development in our country. But so are workplaces, so is the military, so are direct-to-consumer technology-mediated means. So are some of these uh, emerging ways in which individuals are, are actually finding ways to uh, work in, in collaborative learning contexts using technology in ways that we didn't envision even in our recent history. So I think what's happening is a post-secondary learning ecosystem is evolving, it is actually uh, uh, changing, and uh, that we actually need to think not just about a higher education system, but, but about a system of post-secondary uh, learning, an ecosystem of post-secondary learning, where people can um, gain 
knowledge, skills, and abilities from a lot of different contexts, get that knowledge, skills, and ability uh, uh, credentialed, in other words, get a degree or a certificate or a certification or something else, and actually apply it in their work and their life. And this is a very different idea, I think, than what we have uh, thought of in terms of post-secondary education in the past. Really, it is this ecosystem of post-secondary learning where there are many different ways to learn, and we have to meet the learners where they are, help them uh, recognize or develop their potential, uh, and then uh, cred credential that, that uh, once we've uh, certified that, in fact, they do have those knowledge, skills, and abilities that they can apply in work and in life. So it's a very interesting but, I think, important notion that a post-secondary learning ecosystem is what's going to drive the talent development and ultimately American prosperity because talent is so tightly tied to our success as a country. So, you know, I think that uh, we need to think hard about this idea of return on investment. I think we've tended to think about return on investment from, uh, for example, a federal or state government perspective. In other words, what are we putting into our post-secondary learning context and what are we getting out of it in terms of graduates, in terms of uh, people who can apply themselves in, in work and in life. And so I think this ROI analysis applies in lots of different contexts and we've seen it most recently now from the perspective of employers who traditionally have had these uh, employee education and training programs, often tuition reimbursement programs, that will allow their workers to essentially have a benefit, a cafeteria benefit, to help them advance their own potential within that company. And while that's very important, and ultimately what we want is more people to have high quality uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities, talent that's developed in lots of different uh, learning contexts, I think we need to understand that developing that, um, that uh, knowledge, skill, and ability is hard, that talent development is not cheap, and that there are lots of ways in which you can uh, generate resources in order to do that. So we're seeking to find ways to actually get greater investment in high quality learning. And some part of that clearly would be government's part, some part of that clearly would be the family's part, but we think that employers can increasingly play an important role. Well, in order for employers to do that, I think they need to understand not just what's in it for their employees, but what's in it for them as an employer. And one of the things that we've set out to do in the last couple of years is actually study the return on the investment to the employers in terms of their bottom line. And in other words, in terms of their actual uh, cost savings that come from investing in employee education. And we've now done a series of studies with uh, large employers in which we can demonstrate a very high ROI. In other words, a return on the investment in these tuition reimbursement and other education and training programs that employers make because the employees who, who get these credentials through these employee education programs actually are uh, transfer more internally, they're promoted at higher levels, uh, and they're retained at much higher levels. So there's literally a bottom line uh, savings, a bottom line um, uh, return to the company that exceeds the investment that the companies are making in the employee education and training. So to, to us at Lumina Foundation, this is a trigger. For employers, they should recognize that they're getting back more than they're putting in. And some of the studies that we've done, for example, with Cigna, the employers as a result of those investments have actually invested more in their employee um, uh, education and training programs because they recognize that there's a double bottom line, that their employees are gaining benefit as are they as a company. And, and I think that that uh, approach to thinking about ROI in new ways is uh, really valuable in terms of, of the talent development enterprise. You know, I think that um, talent development deployment is the responsibility of many of us. Employers have a responsibility. Uh, urban communities have responsibility. Educational and training providers have a responsibility. But government has a responsibility, state governments and the federal government. And we uh, know that um, the federal government is a major investor in talent development and deployment. We see it in lots of different ways in which our government does that through, through a variety of different um, agencies and programs. 
Over the course of my career, what I've observed is that most of those are not well connected. They don't really link up in a way that actually reflects a talent agenda for the country. And so one way in which the federal government could literally uh, do a better job is to actually uh, consolidate the efforts that exist in several different agencies into a single agency that I call the U.S. Department of Talent. Now I want to be clear here, I'm not talking about more government, I'm talking about better government. And by better government, what I'd like to see is the entire U.S. Department of Education, the Employment and Training Administration uh, within the U.S. Department of Labor, and the talent re recruitment and attraction functions that exist in the Department of Homeland uh, Security, to bring them together into one agency that can actually attract, deploy, you know, attract, um, produce, and deploy the talent that we need uh, as a country. I think by uh, developing this U.S. Department of, of Talent, we would actually send a powerful signal to employers, to our international competitors, uh, and to American society at large. We would demonstrate that the federal government is serious about this task of talent attraction, talent development, and talent deployment. And one of the reasons why I advance this idea, this uh, idea is, is one that I've, I've had in mind for many years, is in part based on my experience of two decades in Washington, D.C., where I saw very little collaboration, very little cooperation across agencies. And many of these agencies actually have a shared purpose and, and goals but because of the nature of government, find it difficult to collaborate and, and cooperate. And there have been many efforts to do this, well-intended efforts, particularly between the labor and education departments, but many of them have not come to, to fruition because of the, the, the nature of the bureaucratic enterprise. So this idea of a U.S. Department of Talent is an effort to sort of crack the code, to actually change the way the federal government approaches talent uh, development and deployment by creating this new entity, this U.S. Department of Talent. And, and I think it's one way of changing the way we think about the federal government's role by recognizing that all of these entities are actually aimed at the same outcome, the same, the same set of results. Those results are a higher quality workforce, a more prosperous American society, and ultimately a stronger democracy. So I think in order to be able to attract, uh, uh, produce, and deploy the talent that we need as a society, we actually need a plan. We can't simply assume that uh, this process will unfold on its own. Unlike in the 20th century when um, America had the talent that it needed to be the best in the world, to be the envy of the world, uh, today we need to actually have a plan, a strategy, in order to, to make that uh, American talent a reality. We need a higher level of talent. We need more talent. And all of these things have to go into this five-point plan that I've outlined in the book. The first part is to redesign higher education to actually help it uh, produce more and better graduates so that it can serve America's talent needs in new ways, to build upon the successes that it's had in the past, but to focus on producing more equitable outcomes for much broader groups of learners, to find ways to redesign delivery to reduce the cost, to uh, actually uh, improve the quality of the learning by ensuring that the degrees and other credentials actually represent real and relevant learning. So redesign of higher education is one element of that. The second is to see the private sector as an important partner in this enterprise. Private sector innovation can be a very important catalyst for the kinds of change that we need. The private sector has a role not just in providing capital and providing resources, but also has the ability to produce innovative approaches that can actually help us create higher levels of talent. And there are many mechanisms from doing this. So harvesting the capital that comes from private capital markets in new and creative ways is one way to do that. Another is actually to develop new types of enterprises, new approaches, in order to be able to serve um, more people better. So some examples of this would be to use uh, social impact or what are sometimes called social innovation bonds to actually produce uh, more of these uh, outcomes that we need. In the case of, of these uh, social impact bonds, uh, they've historically been used uh, in other areas, not in education and training, uh, where essentially it's a paper performance contract with a provider, a guarantor, 
and a funder, and it's a three-way funding relationship where if the provider actually can produce the outcomes that are, are um, expected, uh, the funder actually provides more resources to do, to do more of that work. Similarly, I think we need to think about new legal structures like B corporations to actually create literally more enterprises, literally more uh, organizations that can actually produce the talent that we need. B corporations are essentially low profit uh, companies. These are uh, legal entities that uh, can produce a profit but don't have profit as the primary motive. And in the context of post-secondary learning, we think it's very important for us to see not just a nonprofit or a for-profit sector of learning, but something in between where you'd see more innovation being developed by these B corporations, these new innovative enterprises, where they uh, can receive uh, some fiduciary um, uh, return, some financial return from, from their efforts, but not in a legal sense make maximizing shareholder value their primary uh, goal. And so these B corporations are another way in which the private sector can use its innovative potential to help us be uh, more successful. The third way we can do that is to actually rethink our approach to, to immigration uh, in the United States. Uh, immigration has always been a very important part of what has made us prosperous as American society. We are, we are a nation of immigrants and we've uh, really been um, um, uh, use that, um, that uh, approach to immigration, our, our welcoming approach, to uh, make us more successful. We know from research that entrepreneurs are highly represented in the immigrant population, that immigrants play a major role in providing uh, uh, the cultural capital that makes us a unique country in this world. So immigrants have always been a part of our, of our American prosperity and need to continue to be so. But uh, in uh, American society today, much of what we talk about when we talk about immigration is really the problems of immigration, border security and other issues. And while those are certainly important issues for us to deal with, the most important issue that we need to deal with when it comes to immigration is actually producing the American society that we want, to actually use immigration as a talent recruitment and development function to help us achieve higher levels of American prosperity. So that means a new approach to immigration that actually puts its thumb on the scale of the skills of the people who uh, enter our country through immigration. Uh, these models have actually uh, proven successful in places like Australia and Canada. Uh, to, in order for them to work, you have to focus not just on the high end, but also on the middle and then the lower ends of talent so that you ensure that there's an equitable approach to talent attraction through immigration uh, that's uh, used in the immigration uh, system. Similarly, part of what you need to do through our uh, immigration efforts, I think, is to do a better job of educating the immigrants who are already here to actually provide greater opportunities for people uh, who have limited English ability, for people who may have uh, uh, legal issues associated with their current status, to actually help them get into a more um, uh, appropriate uh, context, to actually help them achieve that legal status so that they can go to school, learn, and ultimately um, uh, develop the talent that, that uh, they, they achieve their potential, develop their own talent, so that they can be successful, but equally important so that we together as American society can be, can be successful. So immigration is an important part of, of that approach. The fourth way to, to do this is to um, use our um, resources uh, at the federal level to redesign uh, how we approach uh, the federal investment in talent development and deployment by creating this new enterprise called the U.S. Department of Talent, which would consolidate existing entities, the U.S. Department of Education, the Employment and Training Administration of the Department of Labor, and the employment or, or the talent recruitment uh, and attraction functions that exist in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So rethinking the federal role in talent development and deployment is the fourth way to do that. And the last way that I talk about in the book about um, to getting to this new talent paradigm in America is to rethink how we see our cities and urban communities. I think for too long we've seen our cities as educational and social problems to be fixed rather than rich hubs of talent where creativity and knowledge actually prosper. 
So rethinking our approach to, um, to cities is going to requ require us to understand that collaborative partnerships involving the private sector, educational institutions, civic leaders, and others actually will have to come together, determine what the talent needs are in the community, and develop the talent in those communities. Now, many uh, communities in this country do a good job of attracting talent. In other words, they find ways in which they can bring more talent to their cities through economic or other, or other incentives. And for the most part, that's okay. In other words, it's good for cities to see themselves as places where they want to attract talent. But if we want to solve America's talent challenge, we have to make sure that we grow the talent pool. That means that we can't assume that one city's gain isn't going to come at another city's loss. We, so we've got to help actually grow the talent. And in order to do that, cities need to develop these plans, these collaborative efforts to actually set goals and set about uh, developing and ultimately deploying the talent in those communities that they need. So this is a very different way of thinking about uh, cities and urban communities. Seeing them as talent hubs, I think, is a, a, a new idea, an idea that really helps us understand that the future of American life, which is increasingly urban, is going to require us to under, understand and recognize that cities are talent hubs. And, and if, we, if we understand that, I think we will get to a very different point. Well, you know, I'm an optimist, and as an optimist, I believe that we can produce and deploy the talent that we need to create a second American century, to actually build on the promise that Henry Luce offered us in the first American century, what, what he described as Life Magazine's publisher in, in the 1940s, as uh, the opportunity for America to be the leader in, uh, the global leader in all, all ways. Uh, I'm optimistic because I believe that we have the motivation, the desire, the will, that can-do American spirit to actually uh, create this American, second American century. But in order to do that, we actually have to have a plan. In uh, the American century, the first American century, the 20th century, we got there because of guts and ingenuity and a drive and a good K-12 uh, educational system and an elite higher education system. That's very different than what we need to do today. Today we actually have to produce and deploy that talent by having a plan. A plan like what I identify in America Needs Talent where we actually come together as different segments of American society around this shared goal of actually producing and deploying that talent that will help us be prosperous. Now in order to do that, I think we need to understand what the benefits are, what the outcomes are that we get from this higher level of talent. And uh, I've actually identified in the book this, this notion, this concept that I call the gross talent product, which is actually a monetary means of describing both the market and the non-market benefits of American talent today. Uh, today that is about seven trillion dollars, and so it represents a substantial part of the gross domestic product, the GDP. Uh, that, uh, that is uh, what makes up American society today. So we've got to see the second American century as an opportunity to grow the GTP, the gross talent product, to help us become more prosperous by actually recognizing that the monetary and, and uh, other uh, benefits that come from talent can actually be measured through market and non-market means. So market means would be things like employment and wages and other things. Non-market means would be things like quality of life and our ability to, uh, to be prosperous in general. We can actually measure those things. And what we have to do, I think, in the second American century is recognize that the gross talent product needs to grow just as much as our gross domestic product does as a nation. I think for a long time we've measured our progress as a country by the size of our economy, by the, domestic, uh, the gross domestic product as an expression of the size of our economy. But going forward, I think that we'll have to see the gross talent product as the most important expression of our success as a country because while the size is certainly one element of our success, many other countries will uh, do and will have large economies, but what's going to distinguish us as Americans is our talent. American talent is really what's going to make a difference in our success in the 21st century.